And to our guest speaker, to the College of Nursing presents another International Balikturo Program on Current Trends in Nursing Practice in the United States of America by BSN Class 1980, Dr. Susan B. Gabayeron, Doctor of Nursing Practice. To officially start this program, may I request everyone to please rise for invocation to be led by Jonah Jean Batwigas, Level 4 student, and to be followed by the singing of Rabansang Awit by Maria Eliza Wesodava, Level 4 student, and School Hymn by Kim Malakoton, Level 4 student, conducting respectively. Let us bow down our heads and put ourselves in the holiness of God. Dear Almighty and ever-loving God, we glorify and thank you for this day. You have showered us with so much blessing, and your presence continuously reminds us of your faithfulness and guidance. We humbly ask to shower our speaker today of your greatest inspiration, so that she may share the most of her knowledge, heart, and soul to the topic that she is going to share. May we also absorb the invaluable knowledge, experiences, and put into practice what we may learn today. Lord, your infinite blessing would mean the success of this seminar. We may be a we may be a living witnesses of your genuine love through the enactment of the knowledge acquired through this activity. We ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. His opening remarks, let us all welcome Attorney Salix E. Alibuga, MAN LM, Acting Dean of the College of Nursing. Thank you, Mr. Frial. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the international balikturo of our alumna, Dr. Susan Gabayeron. She will be properly introduced uh, this afternoon before her talk. Okay, I would like to acknowledge our special guest from the Professional Regulations Commission, member of the Professional Regulatory Board of Nursing, who happened to be our administering officer in our oath-taking ceremony for the November 2017 pastors. May I ask uh, Dr. Cora Anyonuevo. Okay. 
So member, Board of Nursing of the Professional Regulations Commission. So we are glad uh, that she is with us this afternoon, okay, to witness how we do the International Balik Turo Program. This is already the third of the series for 2018. Uh, our alumni would not go back to the United States or any part of the country where they are working unless they go back to CPU College of Nursing to conduct a lecture. So it has become a privilege and an obligation for them to share their knowledge and their current practice in the United States of America. So this afternoon, yeah, this uh, Balik Turo can be viewed uh, uh, through Facebook Live, courtesy of the CPU XL TV. Okay, uh, I would like to acknowledge also our Vice President for Academic Affairs at the back, Dr. Irving Domingo Rio. Sir, can you give a short talk before Dr. Gabayaron will, uh, uh, ano, will uh, start the Balik Turo? Okay, so in behalf of CPU College of Nursing, okay, welcome to this uh, uh, Balik Turo of Dr. Susan Gabayaron. I will give the, the microphone now to Dr. Irving Domingo Rio for a short talk. Good afternoon, everyone. I said to myself a few minutes ago, let me have a look at their activity. So this is not part of the activity for me to give a short talk. <laughs> Nonetheless, allow me to give a very, very short talk instead. Balik Turo is a matter of privilege. Balik Turo is free of charge. So let us thank our resource person for giving her time for free. You will hear her experiences, uh, experiences in nursing in America. I'm sure all of you have that desire to work in the U.S. So it's high time for you to listen to realistic experiences from people holding middle and high positions in the U.S. And I'd like to commend Attorney Salex Alibogha for that enthusiasm to invite resource persons of this kind. Uh, you will have more learning uh, activities in the coming years. So let's thank your very active Dean, Attorney Alibogha. He has too many plans for the college. And internationalization is part of those plans. So hopefully in the coming years, you will have classmates from ASEAN countries. And hopefully some of you can do your practicum abroad. That is part of our direction as an autonomous university. So to end my very short, short talk, Okay, so sit back, relax, and enjoy the learning process. Above all, make learning process an enjoyable activity. Thank you and good afternoon. Thank you so much to Attorney Salex A. Albuga and to Sir Rio. For the program objectives, for the general objective, this academic exchange is conducted to update and enrich the perspectives of the participants on international healthcare issues. For specific objectives, at the end of the lecture, participants will be able to first, discuss healthcare issues in nursing practice. Second, explicate the roles of nurses in global healthcare issues, confronting patient care in the practice of nursing profession. And lastly, to express their own perspectives on international issues, care issues affecting nursing profession. For the introduction of guest speaker, may I call on Professor Joella V. Rio, MEN Academic Coordinator. Good afternoon, everyone. We are very happy to have our speaker here today. Uh, our speaker 
has at least 35 years of clinical experience as staff nurse, church nurse, and nurse supervisors in various uh, hospitals, institutions, in the U.S., especially in California. Because you know the, the CV of our uh, speaker is uh, five uh, pages. So I have to make it concise, but complete. She, her uh, experience is mainly, no, mostly, in trauma, critical care, no, and surgical, a uh, medical surgical nursing. That includes the veter, uh, including the Veterans Affairs Long Beach Healthcare System. So she's also working with the uh, U.S. veterans. And for the U.S. Uh, citizen, it's a very uh, prestigious uh, opportunity to be working with the veterans. And for her education, of course, we are very proud. She is the pride of class of 1980. Five years program because, uh, you know, students, for your information, Batch 1980 uh, has two group of graduates. And graduates of a five-year program, they were the last batch of the five-year program, and we have the first batch of the four years program. So two program in class 1980. So our speaker belongs to the five-year program. Then her Master of Science in Nursing in University of Phoenix, La Palma, California in 2009. And her doctor in nursing practice in Chamberlain University, Chicago in 2017. For her licenses and certification, there are several. Of course, she is a licensed, a registered nurse in California and also hold a certification in advanced cardiac life support, basic life support, pediatric advanced life support, trauma nurse core curriculum, critical care registered nurse certified, certified medical surgical nurse, and also managing assaultive behavior. For the awards, I, I was intrigued when I read because she was a DAISY Award winner. So I thought, what is this DAISY? The only DAISY I know is a flower. Do you know DAISY a flower? <laughs> so I have to, you know, do some research. What is DAISY stands for? Okay, for everybody's information. DAISY stands for Disease Attacking the Immune System. Okay. And I read further. What is this award? Because this must be a very prestigious award. So the DAISY Award, because our speaker is a recipient of this award. The DAISY Award was established by DAISY Foundation in memory of J. Patrick Barnes, who died due to idiopathic thrombocytopenic purpura at age 33. And in recognition for the uh, care of nurses while J. Patrick was sick, the family uh, started this foundation to recognize the work of nurses. So who are those nominated for this award? These are nurses who are nominated by their colleagues no? to be given an award because they possess an exemplary bedside nursing care, compassion, 
courage, integrity in every situation. There are individuals who demonstrate excellence in the delivery of patient care and promotion of their professional nursing career. That is our speaker because he received this award. And for her membership to several associations, she is a member of American Association of American Critical Care Nurses, American Academy of Medical Surgical Nurses, AACN Chapter of Long Beach and Orange County. He is also an America member of American Nurses Association and another prestigious membership. She is a member of a Sigma Theta Tau. You know what is Sigma Theta Tau? It's an international society of nursing scholars and nursing leaders who demonstrates excellence in scholarship and exhibiting exceptional achievement in nursing. Membership to this prestigious society is by invitation only or by recommendation. You do not apply. You are being recommended. Okay. Professional development of our uh, speaker. He has the FLOW Academy graduate, a Lean Training graduate, and an advanced train trauma training in Coley Shock Trauma Center, Maryland Medical Center. So, without further ado, I am very proud to present to all of you the pride of class of 1980. Dr. Susan Gabayero. Hi, guys. I'm having butterflies. <laughs> anyway, um, thank you, Dean Salex, for inviting me. And of course, my friend Jeffrey in America for uh, convincing me to come and talk to you. Uh, I usually do some classes in the uh, facility where I work. Uh, I work in St. Francis Medical Center for 36 years, but I also work in Kaiser Permanente. I have worked in Department of Veterans Affairs. Uh, I have very wide uh, nursing experience from med surge, telemetry, um, critical care, emergency room, postpartum. The only area that I didn't cover is labor and delivery. So, uh, but uh, I'm glad to come back to, to CPU. I'm a proud Centralian. I always um, tell everybody I'm from CPU. I'm from the five-year uh, class 1980 because I have to differentiate that because of the two classes uh, who graduated for that year. Uh, and I would like to um, also mention my nieces with me, Janine Puentes, and I have a nephew that just graduated two years ago. So my family are Centralian. Um, I also have cousin uh, Ernesto Hardilesa that's teaching here. And uh, I, I enjoy coming to CPU, and I always love uh, looking at the university church. But um, at first, when I was invited, I really don't know what I'm going to say or talk about. But Jeffrey told me, oh, just talk anything about nursing. My specialty is in nursing practice. Um, I was debating when I took my doctorate at first whether to take PhD or take DNP. PhD is more on academia and research, and doctor of nursing practice is more at the bedside. That's where I belong. I change policies and protocols, make a better nursing practice. So I develop um, standards of practice, I do research, but it's more of nursing practice. 
So, uh, like in our facility, I did so much teaching. I, um, my first biggest thing was code sepsis like 10 years ago. And I was able to get almost a million dollars of sponsorship from a foundation to start it. And I was very proud of it because it was a new evidence-based practice. It killed so many people, almost 750,000 um, population are affected and more than one third of that dies of sepsis. So that's one of my uh, biggest um, uh, accomplishment, and I think I passed some paperwork on that. Uh, so you can see that early identification of sepsis, especially when you have SEERS identified at the beginning and start the goal-directed therapy, the chances is uh, higher for the survival rate. The later you find out about it, uh, it might be too late. So usually when our patient comes to the emergency room, we call code sepsis when they, benef when they are identified by the nurses. So one of the things, I'm gonna have a price later on because if you are really listening, <laughs> so you have to name the four Sears, you know, if your heart rate, is greater than 90, your respiratory rate is greater than 20, your WBC is greater than 12,000, or your WBC is less than 4,000, or your temperature is greater than 100.4. So um, all those things are very important on the identification of sepsis. And the earlier you can do it, the chances is better uh, of survival before it becomes hit the dysfunction. So those are uh, early sepsis, the lactate are like two, and then when they get to the organ dysfunction, then they become um, severe sepsis, and then go into septic shock. So uh, you can see on that um, um, paper that I have distributed, it was really, um, very easy to treat, but very uh, hard once you get septic. Okay, and uh, so when the pair, when the patient gets into the emergency room, we have to uh, get all the labs, the X-rays, everything, fluid resuscitation. We have to start patients on. Uh, Pressors, if they don't respond on the fluids, they get admitted in ICU. We started antibiotic. One thing you need to understand is before you start any antibiotic, you need to get the blood cultures first. Okay, you don't start any antibiotic without any cultures sent to the lab. So, uh, so you can identi identify the organism much better before the antibiotics goes on board. And then uh, we take care of the patients while they're in critical care um, because if the patient goes into septic shock, the chances is the survival really goes high. The mortality, I mean, goes high. And uh, we treat them well after they get better. Uh, some of them get intubated and extubated and then um, they get better, they get transferred to the floor. Uh, for some patients that get intubated, one thing we do in uh, US of A, once they're intubated, you have to uh, sedate the patients and also give them medication. We just don't sedate patients because the first thing that they do is when they are intubated, the first thing when the patient wake up, they yank the tube. So you don't want them to compromise and pull out the tube because they still need to be vented and hyperoxygenated. So uh, you can see there's like six early goal directed therapy and one of them is oxygenation. And um, so you need to make sure that they are well oxygenated. We also do uh, put some central lines, uh, but there's latest technology now that you don't need to put a central line. You can just put the EKG patch and it has the reading of the CBP uh, already. So uh, we're getting fancy with, when it comes to uh, 
uh, sepsis. It's a non-invasive treatment uh, instead of uh, central line. Um, okay. Um, the other thing that we have uh, that we've been doing besides sepsis, we also we call code sepsis when the patient presents in ER. So there are teams that respond to emergency room to make sure. So the, the emergency room doctor, the intensivist, the phlebotomist, the respiratory, uh, the, the ICU nurses, they come and help make sure there's lines, the labs, everything, the x-rays done in a timely manner so we don't have to waste any time. And then the other thing that we have, we also have stroke because St. Francis is a, a trauma center, a STEMI center, and also a stroke center. So we also have like code stroke. Our code uh, stroke, we have this thing, not all facility have the stroke capability like we do. Uh, you have to remember, if you develop any uh, type of weaknesses, we have this thing that we call FAST to identify early stroke symptoms. So FAST is the facial, like for example, they have facial droop, and then uh, for A, uh, they have their uh, arm weakness, and their S, uh, S is like um, speech, and then the T is the time. We have to have identify the patient in order for them to meet the uh, anti um, the TPA. They have to be within 3.5 hours from the last well known time. So if they went to sleep at nine o'clock at night, and then you notice at six o'clock they woke up, they uh, don't meet the criteria anymore. So you need to be able to say, oh. Uh, I saw him at 9 o'clock at night after dinner, and then he woke up at 12 midnight that he cannot speak or something happened, then you know that he's within the certain time. So you can treat uh, that patient as soon as they call um, the paramedics, they bring that to emergency room, they call ahead, so when the patient gets there, they already respond uh, in a timely manner, we are, uh, we have to have 60 minutes to identify everything. So within five minutes after their arrival, they get the labs, they have the x-rays, everything. Um, I think I have um, that one too. Yeah, you can pass. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, you know, when the patient uh, gets to the emergency room, they have uh, identified we are limited to certain amount of time to make sure that they are treated fast enough. Um, and then um, within 25 minutes, CAT scan needs to be done and the doctor, the urologist needs to be uh, notified. So uh, TPA will be administered in less than 60 minutes. So that's within one hour from the time they were called. So that's the stroke. And the uh, patients who gets, um, who gets the TPA are also risk for bleeding. So you need to be able to identify um, signs and symptoms of intracranial bleed, like for example, sudden headache, or nausea and vomiting, or uh, altered level of consciousness. These patients, sometimes when they man manifest le altered level of consciousness, that's already late signs. So I just have a patient, like uh, not my patient, but one of my nurses' patient, two weeks ago before I came, he was awake, alert, oriented, he's a veteran, um, he got to the hospital within like an hour from the last known well. He got the TPA, everything. Uh, CASCAN shows no signs of bleed because you cannot give TPA for patients with bleed or uh, any, there's some exclusion and inclusion criteria that we have to meet. If they have any type of symptoms of bleeding, then they cannot get the TPA. But what happened is um, it doesn't show anything on the CAT scan, and suddenly, four hours after the TPA, he has a severe headache. And then, because he's also a STEMI, 
he, he had some symptoms that mimic the symptoms of stroke. He came in with, uh, when we call STEMI, that we call it ST elevation MI. And uh, the patient went to cat lab, had his vessels open, went to the, um, and then went to the ICU, and then he has this, uh, he had a TPA. He had a severe headache like two hours later. They gave him Tylenol. He was on nitro drip. They turned off the nitro drip because nitro can give you headaches. So everything is within where you practice it. But three hours later, you cannot arouse the patient. We took the patient to CAT scan, and guess what? There's a massive bleed and shift, and in 30 minutes, the patient is comatose. In one hour, he's brain dead. How can that happen? It's the risk you take when you get a TPA. There's no, um, it's only 6%, but you might be the lucky, unlucky 6%. So uh, we're very, very cautious. We always try to get the um, CAT scan um, before we even administer the TPA. And for patients that doesn't meet the criteria of TPA, for those patients that are more than 4.5 hours, um, stroke uh, patients, they go to the radiology and they do a radiology embolectomy. They remove the embolus. Uh, it's more advanced, uh, invasive, but that's the way uh, they do it. So we have a lot of good things. It's like I feel like we're extending patients' life more and more each day. Because <laughs> always, there's always new evidence-based practice that will come in that uh, we have to do at the bedside, okay? Uh, for those non-TPA patients, sometimes you can say, like, uh, TIA manifests the signs and symptoms of stroke, and then a uh, few hours later, they will be okay just if nothing happened. But you have to remember, if you had a stroke the first time, the chances of getting you to have a recurrent stroke is very high. So we always give, um, a good uh, discharge education to the patients and family, teach them the, the, how to identify the stroke signs and symptoms, and make sure they, comply, they are compliant with their medications. Okay, um, another practice that probably we do right now um, in the hospital, I'm just going to bring you some of the evidence-based practice that we have. Uh, the other thing is the post-cardiac arrest. When patient comes in, we do a hypothermia, okay? Uh, we have a cooling, we call it IC catheter that we insert to the right groin all the way inside and we can cool down the patients in a matter of a uh, couple of hours, even if their temperature is up. So we have to bring it down. Their chances of survival is very high. There's also uh, exclusion if they are bleeder, they're not, uh, they cannot have that. If they are comatose before the cardiac arrest, they cannot have that. If they're pregnant, they cannot have it. You have to be like a new cardiac arrest patient. So there's like inclusion and exclusion on that. I think I have some of that too, Janine. Yeah, no. you can give away both, yeah. I made some few copies of the stuff that I have. I did not prepare um, coming in <laughs> for uh, really a full lecture, but uh, I can just enumerate to you the practice that we have that we can also use in this country and be more um, up to par with the international community. Uh, we also have, uh, we call core measures that we do in every single facility. Uh, this is the way the Joint Commission and um, facility and the insurance company look at your facility and performance. So, uh, for example, we have uh, performance, uh, one of the core measures that we have in critical care is Club C, which is central line um, central line uh, infection. So we are tracking how you uh, wipe the hub, 
you know, with alcohol, not just like just wiping it. You need, really need to scrub the hub. We have those uh, things. We have to change our uh, central, our IB tubings every three days. We need to change our central line, remove the central line in less than three days to uh, put a pick line if it's a long term or uh, permacat. So anything that we can to prevent central line infection, we have to do what we have to do. Uh, we also have to culture uh, patients to make sure we, they did not develop the bacteremia while we're in their facility. And also, uh, if we have central line infection develop, the reimbursement to the facility um, is, uh, they, they did not get reimbursed otherwise because the infection developed there. So the same thing with the skin breakdown. When patient comes in and no skin tears or skin breakdown, or the, we call it the cubitus. Over there, we call it pressure injury. We don't call it the cubitus. Nobody calls uh, the cubitus over there. We call it pressure injury. So uh, we have to identify it. The easiest way to uh, identify is it on admission. For example, when your patient comes in, the early assessment you have, if you see a skin uh, like a DTI, like deep tissue injury, that means the skin is like black or purple, but it has not broken down, you need to identify that because behind that might be a skin breakdown, a stage two, three already when it breaks. Okay, and then when you have a skin breakdown, like for example in your coccyx, your elbow, your ear, and then you don't, you know, you're, you don't know what stage it is, you have to identify it as uh, unstageable. So you need to know those things, and we train nurses, and we have a video for them to watch to make sure they can identify stage one, stage two, three, four DTIs, and um, unstageable, okay? So those are the things, because if your patient develops stage two to stage three, your hospital, your facility don't get reimbursed. So when it comes to money, the facility acts on it. So uh, they have to make sure they take pictures, because pictures speak louder than words. You need to be able to measure it. You need to be able to identify the correct uh, staging of that wound. The other thing that we do, another uh, is um, BAP ventilator associated pneumonia. So when your patient comes in, all vented patients, we culture them to make sure that those are not um, hospital acquired. It might be community acquired pneumonia. So facility gets reimbursed if it's community acquired versus facility acquired. So uh, one thing that I remember when I took the CCRN exam is what is the nursing care? I will never forget that. What is the nursing care uh, to uh, assist to prevent BAP? We call it BAP. And uh, is it, um, the thing is oral care and head, raise of the head of the bed. It's, it's not asking for medication. It's not asking for pep it's not asking for, but it's looking for nursing care. So when you're taking the exam, you have to look at, there are some negative questions, there are some nursing questions, they're very good in giving you negative questions. So you, if you say accept or not, or something you need to look at, you really have to read between the lines and they already calculated how fast you're gonna answer that question. So um, some computer exams right now, when you take the board or you take the certification exam, um, if you have reached like either 240 or something, the machine doesn't know whether to pass you or not. But some people uh, only answers up to 90. The machines already, already failed you or not. <laughs> so it's either way. Okay, um, the other thing that we do besides, um, uh, what other core measures we have? We have a lot of core measures. We track every single thing. 
One thing about our facility, because we are, uh, we, I work in um, uh, Daughters of Charity. It is a Catholic uh, facility. So we are non, um, what do you call that? Um, it's, uh, it's not, uh, you don't, you know, it's um, it's a facility that's for the community. Um, cannot remember. Uh, but otherwise, uh, so we are very uh, particular when it comes to performance and reimbursement. That's the way we deal with um, joint commission. And we also get inspected by joint commission every two years. So right now we're on the... Uh, joint commission window. Our window, it's all the visits are unexpected, unscheduled, so they can come and see you within 60 days before your last one or 60 days after. So you always have to be ready. So you cannot say, oh, I'm just going to get ready when they're here. No, it doesn't work that way because there's no more time when they come. So... Uh, any other things? Um, any question, guys? <laughs> okay. Uh, I gave some handouts earlier. You can see on that uh, stroke preparedness questions we have. Um, it's very informative. This is what I give to the nurses just to keep them up to par, you know, so they will not forget. One thing we remember, um, I will ask you a question and I have a reward for you. From the time they identify from door to the TPA, how many minutes is it? Raise your hand. 60, he said, you're right, 60 minutes. That's door to needle time. Give him one of my, yeah, okay. Let's pray there. And also, if you, have, uh, if you have a stroke patient, for example, you would like to have a higher blood pressure because of the occlusions. But if you have a hemorrhagic, uh, a hemorrhagic stroke, you want a lower pressure so you don't bleed, increase the bleeding. So usually what our doctor wants is like less than 140, but for ischemic stroke, they want it more than 180. So we don't really act on anything until, so if the patient um, gets hypertensive, uh, we have to try labetalol IV first. Uh, that's our drug of choice. And the next one is uh, Cardin drip if we cannot control it. So uh, we have also a standard um, protocol, like for example, uh, nursing protocol or bundle when the patient comes in. So when the patient gets admitted to ICU, you don't need to wait for the doctor to give you orders. We already have um, doctors a set up like a protocol, like stroke bundles that you need to follow, like uh, the MRI, the swallow screen, the medications, um, and the doctor, our doctors there have access uh, from, especially the neurologist, uh, cardiologist, and intensivist. They have access for, from their home to the hospital PAX machine. Those are like the x-rays. So they can see basically after the CAT scan, they can see if the patient has a bleed or not. They don't need to physically come to the hospital to tell you what's going on. Because once they find there is a bleed that they need to take the patient to surgery, before you call them, they're already en route. And uh, if we have a STEMI patient, for example, they, the patient was called a code STEMI, 
those are um, patients that has a, a myocardial infarction, that means heart attack. They also, uh, because we are a STEMI receiving center, patients from Kaiser, from the neighboring, neighboring uh, facilities bring their patients to us, and we have our cardiologist and our cardiac team 30 minutes to respond, because the door time to treat is 60 minutes. So if the patient's coming from another facility, they have to be quick. So we have 30 minutes time from there, they go to cat lab, they open up and then they go straight to ICU. It's either they do an angioplasty, they do a stent, they put a balloon, or the patient goes to surgery for open heart. So um, just like the example that I gave earlier, that the patient develop, after the STEMI develop um, bleed, it's because it mimics the sign, the stroke signs mimic the signs of the MI patient. Okay, any question, guys? Um, anything else? Open forum. I wanna give another prize. Okay, also for stroke, what we usually do there, it's a standard for every nurse to complete the NIHS stroke scale. So we go to American Heart, and there you can see the stroke. Uh, you have to take the exam uh, and know how to assess a patient with stroke, because every stroke patient that comes in needs to have a stroke scale. So uh, how to ask where, with their name, their speech, their ataxia, their extremities, all those things. So those are very, very important. So all nurses needs to be certified to stroke, uh, because we're a stroke center, they need to be certified to a stroke scale. The same thing for uh, MI patients. They need to know, you need to know um, how to read your, uh, your EKG, how to identify uh, different types of STEMI, whether it's inferior MI, posterior MI, anterior, lateral, whatever, and what vessels are affected. So you need to know all of that. Um, when you take the CCRN, there's a lot of questions on the MIs. And when you take the boards, there's a lot of questions on the sepsis. There's a lot of questions on the stroke. There's, because even your ACLS, the advanced cardiac life support, covers the stroke and the MI. So uh, they ex that's the expectations for almost every nurse there. You need to, um, uh, one thing I uh, want to tell you guys, uh, CPU is up to par with a lot of things. Uh, you know, it's nice to see, to go from different facilities and you see a CPU grad. We really, we know that we're from Iloilo and we graduated from CPU because of the standards of the care. Uh, a lot of our um, graduates just ju during my time, we don't look at money as uh, number one reason for coming to nursing, but to take care of patients. I remember our Dean Kaipang when I was interviewed and he asked me why you want to be a nurse. I said, to serve humanity. And I, he said, that's the same answer I got from a hundred of you. <laughs> <laughs> but it was so funny. Um, we love her. <laughs> I, uh, my class, we were with uh, Dean Kaipang and uh, my cousin, uh, because when we came in 1975, I think uh, Dean Loreto Tupas just retired at that time. So we, we were with an iron hands. Um, our clinical instructor, uh, Karnahe, oh my God, you know. We are, they are very strict. We were dorm in. You're lucky you are dorm out. We are dorm in. We have to, uh, we are, they are very, 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 very strict. We cannot like go out for a date. <laughs> we really have to study. And we did that for five years. But look at us, majority of us, uh, there were the cream of the crop, you know. 
A lot of us have, uh, are very successful. At least 70, 75 of us are in the United States. Several are in, um, I think, uh, Europe and Canada, and also in uh, Middle East. A majority of our class, we had our class reunion two, three years ago, and uh, I was telling Salex, it was so funny because, you know, it's just, we're like a family. This is my second home. We're very close, so. Any question, guys? Okay, let me ask one more question. Okay, who can give me the four Sears? Okay, look at you. <laughs> Nobody? Oh my God, there. Okay. <laughs> okay. Because that's the early signs of sepsis. You need to know the Sears. So I don't know if we have that, um, but if you know the Sears, that's your guide that your patient's getting septic. Temperature of greater than 30 degrees mm -hmm. Celsius. Heart rate of greater than 90 beats per minute. RR greater than 20 and WBC greater than 12,000 or less than 4,000. Yay, okay, give her another. <laughs> Okay, you want another one? <laughs> okay, well, you need to study hard like her. She memorized it. <laughs> that means she's listening. Okay, um, I'll ask another question. Let me look first. Because I was not ready. <laughs> okay. Define severe sepsis. <laughs> you should know that. I said that earlier. Come on. Stand up. Oh, there's one there at the back. Okay, come on. You know, sepsis kills, so you need to know. Um, severe sepsis is an effect is an infection that can cause disseminated intravascular coagulation as a complication. Okay, anything else? It has involved multiple organ dysfunction. Yeah, go ahead and give... Come on, come back! Okay, one more. I think I have one more gift there. Okay, for your stroke patient, what is the last known well time acceptable before the TPA? Okay. okay. Um, it's 3.5 hours. 3.5 hours, yes. Okay. <laughs> She's very close to the microphone. <laughs> okay. Do you want to? Okay. Do you have any question for me? I didn't really practice nursing in the Philippines. Because when I graduated from CPU, my petition was already being processed. So actually, I was supposed to leave the country when I was on my third year. But I told my mom, I want to finish my nursing in CPU. So right after graduation, May 1980, I flew. We graduated like uh, April 1st, 
And after that, I went to Manila, had my physical, and I have to go before I turned 21. So I left the country May 22, and my birthday was May 25. So when I get there, I have to be less than 21, or else my papers will be processed down. So it was really tough for Filipinos at the beginning when you take the exam there. Uh, when you take the exam during my time, everybody are housed in a convention center and we do paper and pencil. We all, and it's only offered twice a year. Yeah, so uh, if you fail the subject before it's separated, the subjects are like med surgs, OB, psych. So if you fail in psych, which most Filipino nurses does, that's the only thing you're going to attend to. Because I think it's the way we approach mental health. We do it different over there than here. So a lot of Filipinos fail in psychiatry. And then, uh, but lately, uh, because of the computer uh, and technology now, everybody can take their exam uh, through the computer. And you can take it uh, as many as you want. You know, every three months when they process your thing. Uh, but the one thing I was telling uh, Dean Salex, California has very stiff rules when it comes to the board. Because when you're a foreign graduate, they expect you that your med surge needs to correlate with your clinical, your classes to your clinical, same as OB your class to clinical. So if it doesn't, then you have to go back to school. When you go to California, you have to go back and take that subject again. And because you're a foreign graduate, not everybody offers that, only few university. So I think uh, the Philippine, Philippines is changing the way they do things because that's they don't want you to take your med surge in second year uh, for your subject and then do your clinical on third year. They want it to be like next to each other. So if you have any question on the clinical, you can bring it back to the, to the classroom. So that's the way they do things there. So um, a lot of schools now in the Philippines are changing the way uh, they do things with their curriculum because of what California Board of Nursing are doing. They're very uh, strict when it comes to that. Uh, also, I heard from uh, Dean Salex, you have less um, uh, curriculum like us. I, uh, I, I was telling him I have like... Uh, uh, when I was doing the OR, I have 10 majors, 10 minors, we have uh, 10 deliveries, we have, uh, we are really, you know, you really have a lot of things to comply. But there's good things that's happening. Um, Dean Salex and Jeffrey are working towards... Um, Simulation lab, which is a lot of nursing uh, schools are doing in the U.S. because there's not enough um, hospitals to give the experience or hours to the nurses. They're bringing the hospitals to the school, which is simulation labs. You can start your IVs in simulation lab. You can assist how to put a chest tube in simulation lab. You can prepare how to prep like wound cares and stuff to the simulation lab. And that's coming, uh, which is a good thing. And Jeffrey and Dean Salex are very active and uh, a lot of Centralians are putting a lot of money to make sure CPU is up to par with everything. Okay. Any questions? I'm just glad to come back. <laughs> okay. Do you have any question about stroke and sepsis? Okay, I have one question. What is the usual antibiotic you are giving to patients with sepsis in the U.S.? Uh, we have a list of antibiotics depending on the, on the infection. Um, most commonly, we have vancomycin 
uh, ceftriaxone, rosefin, but depending on the antibiotic, or depending on the infection. So we have, uh, for example, on our um, on our facility, we have a doctor. We have let me just yeah list of infections that tells you what antibiotic to use. So um, let me just see. Okay. It says here, if it's unknown, you can use vancomycin, which is the most common, uh, but you also have to be cautious because you don't want to give a BRE uh, on those patients. Pneumonia, septriaxone, or Zitromax. And if they have penicillin allergy, they can have Lebaquin. And then they can also have Piperacillin. And for abdominal uh, infection, they have septriaxone. For urosepsis, septriaxone. Meningitis, septriaxone. So a lot of them, uh, septriaxone um, is acceptable, which is rosefin is the generic drug for it. So a lot of those medications, they are standards. And for every septic patient that comes in, there's um, infectious disease consult put in right away to make sure we get the right uh, medications uh, for anything that cultures comes back positive. Thank you. Here in the Philippines, it has been a practice of most doctors to give broad spectrum antibiotic mm -hmm. before the release of the culture and sensitivity results. Are you practicing that in the US? Yes, we do. Um, we don't wait for the cultures to come back. We just draw the cultures and then start the antibiotic. If it happens to be not the right antibiotic, then we'll correct it later. But at least the blood is drawn. And then treat it, uh, treat it early. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's Because the same broad practice. spectrum antibiotic covers a lot. Then you of, just uh, change the antibiotic after you isolated uh, yeah, the bacteria. Whatever the bacteria is identified. Mm -hmm. Okay. In uh, stroke, what is the first line of treatment that you usually give aside from TPA? Uh, we have um, aspirin, Plavix. Uh, if they are not, no bleed or heparin, you know, any antiplatelet, uh, antithrombic medication, thrombolytic medications. So those are just for the non-hemorrhagic stroke, ischemic stroke. Yeah. Any other question from the audience? From the CIs in the intensive care unit or infectious disease unit, you have some uh, clarifications with regard to stroke. Your, your stroke unit is also armed with uh, angiogram and angioplasty? Yeah. Okay. And we have, uh, our patient goes to, for the stroke, they go to IR mm -hmm. uh, and radiology, and then they do, that's where they do the interventional uh, treatment, like okay. uh, the angioplasty. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Those are done only for patient that goes beyond the 4.5 hours. Okay. Yeah. You also so have there's micro, a, that's another alternative. You also have microsurgery. Yes, for we stroke. do. Mm -hmm. We also do um, what coiling. Mm -hmm. So we do a lot of treatments for the stroke because we're a stroke center. Mm -hmm. Thank you for the info. Yes. Hey, ma'am. You have mentioned earlier about the coronary angioplasty, right? Mm -hmm. um, what is the common problem after the procedure or what are the common problems after the procedure? The common problem after the angioplasty usually because of the entry site is on the right groin and the removal. You, uh, after the removal, you have to be cautious in uh, making sure that pressure is applied. If not, the patient can develop a hematoma that could end up in a pseudoaneurysm. And that could result to loss of pulse on that limb. If they do, then they have to be taken to surgery to remove that hematoma. 
So it's very, very important that once we uh, put the patient, um, they do the, we, we have, we call veno sheet and arterial sheet, which is the catheter that we put on the groin to go in. And if the patient is a bleeder, we keep it there for a while, and then we make sure that the ACT is less than 160, which is the activating clotting factor. So if the, the ACT is less than 160, we go ahead and take it out. If it's more than that, that means the patient will have the tendency to bleed, we don't take it out. So from that time when we remove it, when we remove the catheter, we need to apply a PEM stop or a manual pressure, and then we monitor it. So when we're at the bedside that we have to remove the sheet, we tell another nurse, I'll be here in the room because I'll be staying there for an hour. So she can watch the other patient. But we need to make sure that we don't give the patient a hematoma because that hematoma can result to a pseudoaneurysm. Okay, Mom, thank you mm -hmm. very much. May I ask if what is the nursing management if the patient develops resistance to the antibiotic therapy given? If the patient develops resistance to the antibiotic, it depends because it's we have uh, we have MRSA, methicillin resistance, we have vancomycin resistance. Each one are different. If it's uh, vancomycin, if it's uh, first we isolate the patient. We want to make sure they're all isolated because um, we don't want them to, you don't want to get them. But uh, they are treated with the different types of antibiotic. When the results of the cultures come back, uh, the cultures will say they're sensitive to this drug, they're resistant to this drug. So the infectious disease will choose the one that's the closest to which is the sensitive to the drug. So for example, if they are resistant to vancomycin, then they will find another uh, medication that's, they are sensitive to that medication, to, uh, to the disease, to so the uh, culture, to the bug. Yeah, okay. Good morning. Good afternoon. Um, here in the Philippine settings, ma'am, some physicians practice giving antibiotics pre-op to prevent any infection. My question is, do you practice the same principle since you've said that you don't give any antibiotics without any lab cultures? I worked in a surgical unit before and I developed the surgical care improvement project for the facility. And what we have done in the past is um, we don't usually start the antibiotic until one hour before the cut. So they use the same antibiotic like Sosin or Ansep before the cut. That's the most common medication they use uh, without doing cultures. And then post-operatively, they only get two more doses of that drug uh, for that patient. So it's mainly prophylactic. It's not for treating any type of infection. Yeah. And one thing we do about the surgical care improvement project, uh, in the past we used to shave now we do, we don't shave anymore, we do uh, clipping, okay? That was like 10 years ago, but we still continue that. And then uh, for patients, um, for the same thing for that medication. And then for every patient that comes out uh, surgically, 12 hours after surgery, they get started on um, anti-platelet um, or anti-bleeding medication like uh, Lovenox or Arextra to make sure that they don't develop any uh, 
blood clot like uh, DBT or PE. So uh, patients there in a surgical unit, you have your, for example, you have your surgery today in the afternoon, you're already getting out of bed. Or if you had it in the afternoon, the next day you're walking around. Our open heart patients, you come back uh, in the afternoon, like for example, they did the surgery in the morning, they come back with um, ventilator at around 12, one o'clock, in five o'clock, they're already extubated and then out of the bed by like eight o'clock in the evening. The next, day the next morning, they're already walking around. Patients with open heart go home quicker than appendectomy. Yeah, so uh, three days in the hospital, that's all they have. They, um, so uh, our patients, they are aggressively, because we don't want them and then they have to do their incentive spirometer so they don't get pneumonia. So they're really very aggressive when it comes to treatment. Uh, so nurses needs to work with their therapist and so as with their patients. So you cannot just like, oh, just leave the incentive there for the patients to do. No, you have to be actively doing the role. Okay. Any other question? Okay. Thank you, Dr. Susan Gabayron, for sharing your knowledge experiences, and your expertise in the nursing practice of nursing profession. To give the certificate of appreciation, may I call on Attorney Salix E. Alibuga, MANLM Acting Dean. And Ma'am, Professor Rio, Joel Arvirio, MAN Academic Coordinator, and our guest speaker, Dr. Susan Caballeron. Central Philippine University College of Nursing, Haro, Iloilo City, presents this Certificate of Appreciation to Dr. Susan B. Gabayaron, BSN Class 1980, for sharing with us her expertise and knowledge on current trends in nursing practice, given at Loreto D. Tupas Building, Central Philippine University, Haro, Iloilo City, Philippines, this 31st day of January in the year of our Lord, 20. 2018. Signed, Attorney Salix E. Alibuga, MAN LLM Acting Dean. Signed, Teodoro C. Robles, PhD, University President. A round of applause, please. Thank you so much, Ma'am and Sir. To formally close this Balik Turo program this afternoon, may I call on our clinical coordinator, Professor Maria Lourdes Sampiano, MAN. Good afternoon to everyone. On behalf of our Dean, Attorney Salix Aliboga, all faculty and students of CPU College of Nursing, uh, we would like to give our deepest gratitude to our speaker, Dr. Susan Gabayeron, for giving us time to share her expertise, valuable time, and experiences. Thank you very much, ma'am. We were very thankful for the knowledge you imparted to us, ma'am. We are looking forward for uh, next year's Balik Turo for the next generation of nurses. And we also... Uh, acknowledge the presence of our uh, board uh, board member, uh, nursing board member, Dr. Cora Anunevo. Ma'am, thank you very much for attending our seminar. Uh, these level four students are the next uh, top notchers. <laughs> and uh, Passers for the next uh, board exam. Okay, 
So to the participants, to the faculty who uh, prepared the seminars, thank you and good afternoon. And that ends our International Balik Toro Program on Current Trends in Nursing Practice in the United States of America. Once again, this is Rainer Jambi Priyal, your MC for the for afternoon, and may God bless us all. Thank you.